Hi everyone. This webinar is now live and we already have quite a few people who have found their way into the participant room. We'll just let that continue to populate for a minute um, and I'll just entertain you with introducing myself and I'll just start by letting everybody know this is being recorded. Um, but that, that's fine for the participants because there's no actual audio voice available for participants in this webinar. But welcome to the College of Law, albeit virtually. Um, we're here at the Australian National University welcoming you to the second in our Menzies Cyber Series. For those of you who attended on the last occasion, we talked about future humans. Um, we're very, very excited this evening to welcome you to the beginning and end of truth. Um, maybe it's the beginning of a new truth and maybe it's not the end of anything. We're going to find out though. Uh, my name is Dr. Pip Ryan. I'm an associate professor here in the ANU College of Law. And I'm also very proudly the director of the master's program. So the LLM program, which is the master of laws, um, we welcome law grads and also other grads um, into this program. But that makes me also the director of our graduate certificate program. We've got the graduate certificate of new technologies law, and we have a new graduate certificate that we're launching called the graduate certificate with a specialization in human security. And I mentioned that because I think there's a really strong connection tonight with the, the future of truth or the stability of truth and what that means and human security, but also the role of new technologies. So with 78 people now in this webinar, I'm going to kick off with an acknowledgement of country before I introduce Liz Gillies from the Menzies Foundation, who is the, the genius behind this idea. Um, in acknowledgement of country, I would like to say that I acknowledge that this university, the Australian National University, sits on land that was occupied for tens of thousands of years prior to the arrival of Europeans. I appreciate there are many people attending from places around Australia right now for whom their country sits on the land of people other than those who occupied where the Australian National University is, and I pay respects to them as well. And you might also be somewhere else in the world, and we acknowledge where you are and the First Nations people of your country. I pay respects to and honour all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, as well as their elders past, present and emerging, and those of First Nations people. I was born very close to the Orinoco, although I don't probably look like it ethnically, um, but I am very aware of the fragility of their environment and the environment of many First Peoples around the world. I also acknowledge the stories, the song lines, song spirals, um, and the traditions and living cultures of First Nations people from all over the world. So my, um, my very great pleasure tonight before I introduce our esteemed panel is to introduce you to Liz Gillies from the Menzies Foundation. Liz and I conceived of the kind of experience you're having right now, but I think we're both very proud of the fact that it's landed where it has. Um, just over a cup of tea a number of months ago, and it is something I think that really met an aspiration that we were both imagining and together conceived of exactly what we're trying to do, which is bring together scholars and experts with experience in a particular field that channels into something that we feel is worth discussing in the context of the, the, the realm that technology is creating. And this can include some history, it can include some future and some non-technology stuff. And as a lawyer, I would say there's a lot of non-technology feeding into this. But Liz Gillies, CEO of the Menzies Foundation, welcome. And I would welcome you and invite you to make some um, remarks. Thank you so much, Pippa. It's just delightful, Pippa, to be working with you in the College of Law. I have to say that was a really wonderful welcome to country. And I full of admiration for the spirit in which you shared that with us and the way that it took us to the place I think often is missing in those acknowledgement of countries. So thank you very much for the thoughtful way you do that. Just very quickly, the Menzies Foundation aspires uh, is was founded to acknowledge Sir Robert Menzies' legacy. We're non-partisan and non-political, and we have a grand ambition to raise the profile and importance of outstanding leadership. We do that in we do that in a number of ways. We find we um, identify leadership challenges. We build incubators to unlock innovation and how to address those challenges. And we then take those learning insights around leadership and 
contribute to the national discourse on leadership. And this example of our partnership with ANU is an excellent example of that. One of our areas of focus is the impact of emerging technologies on the law. It acknowledges the foundation's long association with eminent people in the law, Nuni and Stephen being an ex-chairman and somebody who's a very important person in the foundation's past. And uh, he and his family, I know particularly, are very proud of the fact that his legacy is still being made manifest by the opportunity for the foundation to support these sorts of initiatives. So um, welcome everybody tonight. I'm very grateful to the panel and most of all, Pip, for the opportunity to work with you and the lovely way that you curate and um, support this conversation. It's much appreciated. So thanks very much. Thank you, Liz, and thank you to the Menzies Foundation for your very generous support um, and for, for being a part of it, for not just giving and then walking away, but actually wanting to participate and contribute the way you do. So our panellists this evening, we have Jonathan Harley, um, the Honourable Justice Schmidt and Dr Mark Staples. We're very excited to welcome you. For those who are here in the audience, can I just note two things? You're very welcome to post any questions that you might have for the panellists as the evening progresses. But the plan, as you would have noticed in your invitation, is that those questions may not be reached. I would assume we'll get a few and they may not either any of them or all of them be reached this evening. We're just going to give the panellists the space that we have this evening for their, their content and their discussion. The plan is that next Thursday, everyone who is attending now will be invited to a Q&A. It's an invitation only event known as the Cyber Masters. It's the follow up from this. One or two of our panelists may very kindly share their slides or other links to cases or content to share. I will probably do the same via an email invitation with a Zoom link to attend the masterclass. That's one hour next Thursday. And any questions that may arise in the coming days can be emailed to me and then I will pose them to our esteemed panelists and then they can think about it, answer the questions and they won't attend the masterclass live. I will then bring their responses to that discussion. And I'll be very happy to bring some of my research into the role of trust, particularly in automated systems into that discussion. Okay, with no further ado, Jonathan Harley, um, we've been friends since we were in our 20s. It's a real privilege to have known you during the entire time of your incredible career, including as an award-winning journalist. Um, I know you were a bit of a young gun at the start and you have just maintained the most amazing career and trajectory. And we're really looking forward to hearing your spin, particularly when we think about the triangulation of where truth really matters. And where it really matters, and you can find this definition in many, many places in scholarship and I think in Wikipedia, the truth matters most in journalism, the law and science. And that's where we're going to start with journalism and where you see the truth in your domain. Over to you, Jonathan. Thanks, Pip. Hi, everyone. And also I would like to echo your wonderful acknowledgement of country, Pip, and pay my respects to leaders past, present and emerging. Hi everyone, my name is Jonathan. I'm a recovering journalist uh, speaking to you from middle of lockdown uh, in Sydney and I'm going to share my screen um, so you get a little less of me and I, hopefully that's um, coming up. Thumbs up from Pip. Um, tonight, this evening, I'm going to hopefully uh, unpack some ideas around truth, trust, and technology. But as I mentioned, um, those of us in Sydney are very much um, in lockdown. And so in lockdown, of course, you need a bit of a hobby. You need something to do. So I've gone to the basement to see what I could find. Um, my basement would give Marie Kondo conniptions, no doubt. But in my basement is a box, um, a box which looks like this. In fact, the box that has not been opened for the best part of 20 years. So on the weekend, I decided that uh, with this coming and uh, with uh, a bit of time on my hands, it was time to open this box, which is um, jam-packed with many DV tapes, a technology that some may recall and many may have never experienced. And they're tapes from my time when I was a correspondent for the ABC 
based in New Delhi, covering mostly India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, but, but all of South Asia from the period 98, 1998 to 2002. And these are seriously tapes that I haven't seen for a very long time. And one of the tapes that came to my attention early on, let me just flick through here. I don't know why that's uh, just having an issue getting through the next slide. Early on, there was a tape called Afghan August 2000. Um, so nearly exactly 20 years ago to the day. And this is from uh, those tapes that I just literally pulled it in. This is what I came up with. Kabul, just weeks before the start of September 11, um, weeks before that story was going to transform uh, what many of us understood the world to be at that time. And it was really uh, weeks before, as we heard so many times before said, that the world had changed. And it feels to me so uh, resonant looking back on this story and that time when we're still in, a, in the middle of the story, which really is changing how we perceive it. But I actually view this time and this story as one block from September 11th through to the, uh, uh, the Iraq conflicts and the wars, that block of wars, which I actually regard as the last of the analogue stories. And I'll explain what I mean by that. But the last of the analogue stories, because when September 11 happened and the subsequent, um, the subsequent campaign in Afghanistan, which, of course, uh, we've just seen in these recent weeks uh, wind up, as it were, in terms of wind up in terms of US and and, uh, and Australian involvement, but not the end of the war by any measure. Well, remember, this was, this was a story um, still before social media. It was a story before uh, smartphones and mobile had really transformed the news consumer experience. And it was the last big story uh, before misinformation and dis disinformation went to a whole new level. Uh, this is me as a, as a reporter, as a, as a younger reporter, and you'll see there on the right-hand side um, the trusty Sony PD-150, um, which was my tool of choice at that time. Now, it's easily forgotten now, but at this time in, in the, nine, the, sort of the, the mid to late 90s, early noughties, um, there weren't very many um, what we now call VJs or videographers rolling around. It was still very much the time of the traditional TV crew. Um, but I was there in India. Uh, I didn't have access to a crew. And it seemed to me like the obvious experiment to pick up one of these and see where it could take me. And it completely changed the game. It gave me access and freedom and affordability to be able to move across the region in ways that I, I wouldn't have been able to otherwise, partly because of the cost, but suddenly for the ABC, it was just one reporter and a camera, and, a camera uh, and all of the flights and accommodation that went with that. But it also gave me unique access to go to these, these parts of the, the region uh, and chase stories that otherwise wouldn't have been possible. Remember, the Taliban then were controlling most, most of Afghanistan. Uh, under the Taliban, it was um, sacrilegious to uh, capture and convey the human uh, form uh, in photography or film. But by going in with a small camera, I could make my way through Afghanistan um, in a small tar as a pretty small target. And I was really one of the very few, a handful of Western um, uh, TV journalists covering Afghanistan um, in an ongoing way for several years leading up to September 11. It also allowed me to get to places like Hyatt G. Kashmir covering the conflict there between India and Pakistan. The point about this is that this was at a time when the technology was allowing me to get closer to the story. With this new bit of kit, I could actually go and bear witness in ways that were not impossible but much harder under the existing structures. The technology got us closer to truth and closer to being able to capture corners of the world in the nuance and diversity of the world 
that had been previously more difficult. The big shift now is that 20 years later, we've seen that technology has not had that same relationship with the truth. We've seen how technology can, have, can create a much more complex and problematic relationship with um, the telling and the distribution of truth. 20 years on, whether it's, whether it's any of those huge stories of our time, whether it's climate change, COVID, or Black Lives Matter, we're seeing these massive stories, but, but we're also seeing this great argument around what is truth. Now, don't get me wrong. Technology and social in particular has been key to a much richer diversity of voices and nuance. We saw that with Black Lives Matter. We saw that with the Me Too movement. We see it with initiatives like Indigenous X. We also see it with the rise of infographic influences. These are strong and diverse voices on platforms like Instagram, which are really becoming powerful forms of inclusion and diversity. But the paradigm is that when we, while we see this greater focus on diversity and inclusion, we're also seeing a calcification of ideas and facts, facts that are becoming politicised and an audience that can't always discern between facts and opinion. And we've seen this especially clearly, of course, with COVID. We've seen COVID unfurl and turn life on its head. We've been reminded that truth and facts and trust are essential ingredients to a healthy civic society. And during this pandemic, our societal health has been focused on keeping citizens safe, but we've also been reminded of the essential role of another type of health, the quality and reliability of information, what I call the trust economy. And it's not the only economy we're talking about here, more on that later. Of course, fake news has in recent years become the slapdown and slogan of our times, a comical brush aside and a political battering ram. Trump, of course, any news he didn't like was simply fake news. And that had a comic component to it. The gifts would have been endless. And there was something of a Trump vaudeville. But this is about so much more than Trump. And let me be clear, I regard Trump as a symptom, rather than, as a symptom more than anything of driving forces, trends that we've seen the world over, over the last decade or so, rising tribalism, nationalism, crumbling trust in institutions, disinteresting news, breakdown in social and political architecture that we knew in the 20th century. And remember, we talk about those last of those analog stories and how September 11, in many ways, seemed to me to be the end of a whole series of institutions that we believed in in the, in the 20th century. And Trump's fake news um, MO and his disregard for facts also gave wider license to tyrants everywhere, a demonstration to despots and the undemocratically elected around how to operate in a brand new way. We saw that in India, we've seen it in the Philippines, and shockingly, we've even seen um, some really alarming pressures on the traditional understanding of a free and independent press in Australia. Now, what's really amazing about all of these trends is that technology, of course, is key here, but it's sometimes not particularly complex, right? It doesn't, we'll talk about AI and we'll talk about deep fakes, but take, for example, the case of Nancy Pelosi. Um, this is a story of a couple of years ago where um, you might recall there was a huge Ferrari that she was becoming, um, the suggestion that she was becoming cognitively impaired. And that was simply a function of the oldest trick in the book, which is just slowing down a bit of her speech to make her sound slurred and, and um, let's say, incapacitated. Take a look. We want to give this president the opportunity to do something historic for our country. We want to give this president the opportunity to do something historic for our country. 
Now, that's not particularly sophisticated technology. It's just a slowdown, right? But it had it was exactly the sort of um, fuel that could go viral in, in a political environment and with the means of distribution which made that happen. Now, two quick definitions. We're talking about misinformation and disinformation. Misinformation, in simple terms, let's call it a mistake. We got it wrong in journalism, human error, and editing stuff up, false assumptions, the imperfect vortex of time, money, and deadlines that have always been part of the imperfect trade of journalism. Disinformation is about intent. False information deliberately and all too often covertly spread in order to influence public opinion or, or obscure the truth. But I also want to make the point here that we are not passive consumers when it comes to news, far from it. And let's be honest, we all lie. We all lie to ourselves about what we want to see in news and what we actually see in news. Axios had a great bit of data dissection from uh, two years ago now where they really, where they pulled the numbers on what people were actually consuming and what they said they wanted to consume. So, for example, people identified healthcare reporting as ranking number one as the, the editorial topic they wanted to see more of, um, whereas it was actually number seven of what they read. Climate change, they said, was topic number two, but was number five. Education, number three, but was actually number 11 of what they actually wanted to read and consume. So, you know, sports, by the other, on the other hand, um, they said they didn't want more of, but, of course, they, they consumed lots of it. In fact, it, got, uh, it led Axios to, to create the headline, a nation of news consumption hypocrites, no less. Here's what I think is really pertinent. There's a bit of a cognitive dissonance always, but that's okay. As news consumers, our intellectual nature abides by really the basic laws of nature. We gravitate to the state of the least energy expenditure. And this is really important when we look in the context of news being consumed in a passive era of social media. Because we're consuming what floats to our attention uh, in a social environment, um, what floats to the top there, that's the thing grabbing our attention. And that's particularly pertinent when we're talking about misinformation and disinformation. Now, one of the great questions, of course, is, is there actually a future for news? And by future, we mean market. Is there an audience coming through a younger new news, a new news consuming audience? And what I'm seeing is absolutely the answer is yes. Now, I'm lucky because I come to this traditionally as a journalist, spent 20 years as a journalist for the ABC, 60 Minutes Australia, I've worked in production and made docos, but I've also spent the last six years working in technology, first at Twitter and now for the design platform Canva. And in my work, especially in recent years, I'm seeing this, this really interesting regrowth of young journalists building new young news brands and meeting a new news consumer where they are, but really focusing on these areas of trust and truth and reliability. A great example of this is the Daily Oz. This is an Australian um, startup, a Sydney-based startup, where they're meeting their, their news, their young news uh, um, consuming audience, mostly on, on Instagram, but not exclusively. You can see here, it's a really accessible visual form of, of storytelling, but it's really meeting them in a way that we haven't seen before. And this is not unusual. Think about this. The daily broadcast, the New York Times' highly successful daily broadcast, 46% of that audience is under the age of 30. For the Guardian Weekly in Australia, the 25 to 35 demo has been really fast growing for them. So we're seeing there is an appetite, but the news needs to be produced in a way that is accessible to an age group. And the other point is that fake news does not affect all ages in the same way. In fact, the over 60s are much more likely to share and presumably believe this information on Facebook, their primary social platform. Researchers at Princeton and New York University determined that sharing articles from fake news sources was far more likely than those older than 
65. And in fact, nearly seven times more like sharing as many fake news articles as the youngest demographic group. Now, of course, the technology is transforming the game. And the Nancy Pelosi example was pretty basic, but of course, AI is changing the game. And I know Mark is, is going to talk about this later. And of course, the deep Tom Cruise, um, which I can just not get enough of, 1.6 million followers on TikTok. And for those of you who may not be familiar with uh, his form, here's a little example. You know, I do all my own stunts, obviously. Uh, I also do my own music. <laughs> I've got a sweet spot for a couple of artists, and uh, people are surprised that I'm a big Dave Matthews guy. <laughs> So incredible, incredible technology. It just And the thing is, of course, so many different, the, the variation, the depth. Now, of course, we're seeing everyone getting into it, even David Beckham. Malaria isn't just any disease. It's the deadliest disease there's ever been. And in China, we're seeing the first AI news readers. We're seeing the first AI news readers. Now, all of this, of course, changes the game, but we're not quite sure how. Even we're entering an era in which our enemies can make it look like anyone is saying anything at any point in time, even if they would never say those things. So, uh, for instance, they could have me say things like, We wanted now, you back. For oh, we came back from the answer. So bear with me one second. I'll just, uh, just one second while I just uh, reset here because I was just trying to click through there. So the thing is, we're seeing the blurring of these lines in ways what? we haven't seen before, and no one really knows where to from here. Of course, there is no silver bullet. There's no magic wand. There's no paleo diet for a stronger trust and truth economy. And these issues are here to say. But I always like to return to the great Ron Burgundy and ask, how do we stay classy? For me, I think there are three pillars. These pillars of truth, trust, and technology. And we need to lean into all three of them with, with particular intent. Truth. The cornerstone has to be good, fearless journalism, and we have to invest in good journalism. As I say, I'm encouraged by the new um, brand and, and um, wave of, of news brands that are coming through. I'm also seeing reinvestment in the journalistic space by some of the traditional news providers that have found, that had found previously that they needed to um, slash at a newsroom level. So that's, that's part one. Trust is the other piece around consumers needing to know that they are, that they are, that it is verified information from trusted sources. And I'll come back to that in a minute because the technology needs to drive this at scale and support these business models. Now, my reporting days are well behind me, but I'm still invested in good journalism. I work for Canva, the design platform, and we're working with news businesses, everyone from the ABC to Bloomberg to Gannett to, to the Times Group in India to help them not only just reach audiences and find audiences, but consistently brand, make sure their news brands are cemented in everything they do. For any news organisation, brand is the business, trust is the currency, but it's a really crowded space because we live in this idea of what we think of as a visual economy, that we are in the most visual time in human history. We're consuming and creating visual content in ways unlike anything before in human history. The digital revolution has become a visual revolution. And here's where it gets pertinent to this space. Because, for example, last year in 2020, in Canva alone, 
65 million new logos were created. 65 million, which is to say there are 65 million new enterprise and brand plays happening in the world. Why this is really key in the news and journalism and truth and trust space is that news businesses aren't just competing with other news businesses and brands, they're competing with every brand because we're at a stage in the world where every business is a content business. Everyone is now creating this plethora of visual content and the thing is that that content doesn't necessarily mean it's journalistic content. So for for news and truth and trust to be stamped and seen, you have to have this cut through and this assertion. And so in conclusion, as I go through my boxes of tapes uh, through lockdown as we approach this 20th anniversary of September 11, despite the challenges, I'm optimistic, perhaps more by nature uh, and choice than some of the evidence, but I actually think the evidence is there that we're, we're leaning in the right direction. I'm really excited by this new startups and I'm really excited by the energy that I see in a lot of newsrooms and news businesses in the work that I do. And I think the tide is turning and perhaps because I think the tide has to turn. Otherwise, as a society, we become poorer because we get further from the truth. And the truth is fundamentally, in my view, a glue. It's a social glue. And if we don't, we get further from the thing that I'd set out to do 20 years ago with this simple little camera, which is to leverage digital technology to get us closer to understanding the world in its diversity and its complexity and its beauty. I hope we can get closer to and not further from that all important work. Thanks very much to uh, the people of Afghanistan who were always incredibly generous in um, telling their stories and sharing their views and struggles. And thanks very much to you for listening and dialing in this evening. Wow, thanks, Jonathan. That was extraordinary. And hats off to you for the most incredibly visual and enriching presentation. Um, I was I was thinking about that slide you put up with truth, trust, technology, and how interesting it is that I have had so many conversations with people like like Mark Staples, who's here tonight, but also Professor Jason Potts from RMIT, who's an economist, trying to work out how you value trust and what like what is it? What's the etymology of it? What's the opposite of it? What does it look like? And yet this is the first time I've really thought about it from a really important side, which is where you see the value of it as a journalist, which is obviously there's you can value this thing. And I, I thought it was a very, very eloquent final point in relation to truth being glue. You know, and if we just think of who we are as a society, it's amazing you can have had all those experiences and then finish so optimistically. Um, but I'm with you. I'm with you. I, I teach a generation, sometimes 500 of them at a time, of very, very young people. And it is um, just an, an amazing ethos that we see coming out of the, the under 30s, which is really, really wonderful. Anyway, thank you, Jonathan. Um, before we move on to Justice Schmidt, any final thoughts, Jonathan? Anything you wanted to sort of reflect on after my comment? Oh, look, uh, it, it's... It's, you know, I think trust is, because I work, you know, obviously in a, in a commercial environment as well, and I'm, I'm working across media businesses, news businesses, um, but also sports and, and all sorts of other businesses. I think it's very, you know, people are very clear that trust is something that is, that is built over years. It's up by the stairs and it's down by the elevator. And I think we're seeing a much a much deeper understanding of, of building um, trust with audience, um, and that can also mean customers, often it can mean customers, um, and holding on to that. And I think that's one reason why uh, we're seeing a, a rediscovery or revaluing of the value of good journalism, because it's no longer seen as something over there. It's something as, as seen... Um, very much aligned with with a lot of what um, you know the good businesses are trying to do. 
Yeah, that's awesome. And I've got to say that speaks to some of the questions that have landed in the chat. So I'm really looking forward to next week because there's quite a different perspective coming through in the Q&A. We've got some people asking questions about what should this mean in relation to trademarking our faces or what does it mean for trusting what we see in content? So it's going to be a very enriching discussion next week. But thanks for kicking things off amazingly, Jonathan. Okay, to the Honourable Justice Schmidt, who I met in my 20s at about the same time that I met Jonathan, but in a completely different context. Um, I was a judge's associate when I met Her Honour. Um, Justice Schmidt, you, you went to the bench very, very young. So mm -hmm. you have an incredibly rich um, history in the courts trying to discern the truth. And I won't be too negative and cynical about it, but I will say as a barrister in a context in which sometimes, not all the time, people are lying on oath. Um, and so with that, I would say thank you for being with us. Um, the Honourable Justice Schmidt, we look forward to your presentation. Um, thanks very much, Pip. Um, can I just say I'm thrilled to be with you all this evening. It's a wonderful reprieve from the pandemic. And thank you te to technology. You can see neither my shocking ISO hair or my tracky ducks. Um, I also wanted to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we all are and their elders past, present and emerging. And in writing that, it um, really struck me that our concern with identifying truth is probably as old as human life and these ancient cultures. Um, that, of course, plays out every day in courtrooms, but in a very different way to that which Jonathan discussed in the news and those who produce it. We've all pondered, I think, about what truth really is. After all, judges repeatedly see people giving evidence in court about things which they honestly believe to be true, but which other evidence establishes they're mistaken about, and identification in criminal trials is a notorious example of that. One thing which I think most of us will have in common is the ability to know when we are deliberately not telling the truth for whatever reason. We also know that we cannot reliably tell when others are lying. Perhaps intrinsically, we may not know much more about the truth than that. That's why societies the world over have had to develop mechanisms by which they set about finding the truth when that counts. In Australia, we now thus have a very complex mix of common law, legislation and binding precedent, which regulate the pursuit of truth in court. Nowadays, plaintiffs and prosecutors sometimes swing this system into action because of the publication of the, or the dissemination of fake news. That's a relatively new phenomena um, in human experience. Using ever more sophisticated technology for the fast and deliberate mass communication of knowingly false information to others who may not be well placed to detect these fabrications. And as we already know, um, that can cause considerable disadvantage to our civil society and at times real damage to individuals. We're all aware of the recent demonstrations in Sydney and Melbourne over the last weekend um, about the COVID pandemic and its consequences. Um, that certainly gave rise to situations which will soon find their way into court. Many charges were then laid by police, including notoriously in Sydney, cruelty to animals when two police horses were punched, um, it's alleged. Before the weekend was over, reports were circula circulating on social media that published photos of one of the horses being hit were false. That helps explain, I think, why fake news is the Macquarie, Macquarie Dictionary's word of the decade. And it isn't only fake news, as Jonathan's explained, but also what might best be described as fake, fake news, when the truth is knowingly um, dismissed to be a lie, which we're also now seeing. Most of us will remember last year being transfixed by the information which was coming out of America about the impact on its political sphere and the awful and ongoing consequences that we saw there. Tragically, that included what appeared to be the violent storming of the US Capitol building while Congress was sitting as part of its electoral processes, uh, and that's still being dealt with by the US criminal courts. Here in April, when the Chief Justice of New South Wales was speaking about challenges to the rule of law in modern society, 
He explained how fake news can undermine the rule of law when it's used as a destabilizing factor in society, including when social media users are exposed to algorithm-based recommendations to engage with extremist um, content, how digital platforms have begun to respond and how Donald Trump sought to delegitimize the result of the US federal election, even in the US court system. His Honour observed that judicial independence there had prevailed despite the willingness of some lawyers apparently to advance cases without even an evidentiary basis, let alone sound legal argument, contrary to their paramount duty to the administration of justice, which lawyers in Australia also, of course, have. Against that background, I wanted to just touch on three things. Firstly, how judges go about truth and fact finding systemically and in individual cases. Two cases, one Australian and the other Singaporean, which show some of the challenges which fake news can present for fact finding and how judges have dealt with them. And thirdly, how these challenges might be assisted by regulatory change. The first case um, was one decided in December 2020 by Judge Gibson of the District Court when she awarded $125,000 damages in Gaia versus Goshen. There, Ms. Gaia, the daughter of a rugby league great, established that she had become the victim of some particularly vicious fake news. Her dad had had an international career and after a time it had become a sports commentator in mainstream media. Unfortunately, as a result, her identity had become very publicly well known on social media. She led evidence which established that Mr. Gosh had taken her photo from her Facebook page and used it to publish false information about her involvement in a 2019 sex scandal involving a Penrith Panthers player. It was then notorious that he had released a sex tape which had gone viral on social media, showing women having sex with him who claimed that they had not consented to the public release of the tape. That Mr. Goshen was the publisher of the false post was established, even though his NRL meme site was anonymous. He denied being the publisher, but there, under the heading Ironically Fake News, he had published the statement of claim served on him at his home. That's an example, I guess, of how the truth is now routinely dismissed both online and in the real world as fake news. His defence failed because of evidence of a screenshot which contained an admission when he had boasted that he owned NRL memes and I fucking created the page. What he had published was not just Ms Guy's picture but a video depicting her being involved in sex acts which he knew were completely false. Sadly, that post also went viral. I want to describe the inquiries pursued to identify Mr. Goshen and what was involved in having the false post taken down. By that time, it had achieved such mass publication that it continued being recycled in what was described to be a particularly strong grapevine effect. His case was that the NRL memes page was just a scandal sharing page, which no one would take seriously because everyone knows that the internet and social media are both full of face false stories like this. That was rejected, her honour discussing what is rarely attributed to non-internet publications, the sheer panic and terror caused by an avalanche of attention in bar publications presided over by anonymous keyboard warriors. Um, her honour's judgment is colourful and interesting and I um, urge you to read it. Um, she said, amongst many other things, that although such allegations may sound unbelievable or bizarre, um, to those in court, the potential for real harm was not lessened by their implausibility, referring to another case where a retired high school teacher had been severely assaulted after publication of false allegations that he was harbouring pedophiles. Bono also described the contemptuous responses which Mr Goshen had published online to her, Ms Gaia's request for an apology, which she had found involved clearly aggravating conduct. Well, what um, do such fact-finding exercises involve? Firstly, systemically. Our legal system doesn't provide for a judicially-led investigative process conducted in order to sort out the truth. In our society, it is others who are given investigative powers, such as the police and statutory bodies like ICAC and ASIC. Investigative journalists like Jonathan also pursue the truth. 
um, and that can result in investigations by other bodies like royal commissions who are given wider, wider powers than those which judges have in order to establish the truth about matters of concern. In court, it is the parties of the proceedings who lead the evidence by which they seek to establish where the truth lies about what is in dispute. Judges are confined to finding the evidence on, to finding the facts on that evidence, to which they then apply the relevant law in coming to a conclusion. The emergence of deep fakes and synthetic media, media which use sophisticated software and AI to create false images, sound and video, um, which are increasingly difficult for others to detect, like the TikTok video of Tom Cruise, which you saw, underscores the potential difficulties lying ahead for plaintiffs who pursue claims about fake news in court. What such technological advances may mean for humanity provides delicious food for thought, I think, but in court, fact-finding will continue to depend on what evidence the parties are able to lead about the claim to fake news. That is because judges may not decide disputes on the basis of information which is now so readily available to us all online. It's not for them to search for relevant evidence, except in very limited situations when they may take judicial notice of something that is notorious, they are bound to find the facts on the evidence which the parties lead. In Australia, that's a requirement of the common law, which has its roots not only in British and Roman law, but also in the legal practices of the ancient Greeks. It's been developed over centuries in the courts of Britain and now for well over a century by our own. Judicial fact-finding has also been altered by statutes enacted by both our federal and state parliaments, like the uniform legislation enacted in New South Wales by the Evidence Act of 2005. Legislation like that is inevitably the result of reaction, often contested political reaction, to developments of concern to society, and so it can be slow and piecemeal. But as a result, much of the common law remains available to help judges respond to new challenges, including those which fake news can bring. So what is involved in fact-finding in an individual case? First, the plaintiff or prosecutor commencing the proceedings and the defendant responding and eventually identifying what is truly an issue. The parties then serving documents and evidence from witnesses, including experts, to advance their cases, including about disputed facts often important in cases about false news or fake news. Next, the judge resolving disputes about the relevance or admissibility of the evidence, the Evidence Act excluding certain types of evidence which parties may seek to lead in order to establish the truth. For example, hearsay evidence or opinion evidence from a person who is not qualified to give such an opinion. Then ensuring during the hearing that cross-examination is permissible um, that's because Section 41 of the Evidence Act, for example, doesn't permit questions which are misleading or confusing, unduly annoying, harassing, intimidating, offensive, oppressive, humiliating or repetitive, or which put, the witness, uh, put to the witness in a manner or tone that's belittling, insulting or otherwise inappropriate or has no basis other than a stereotype. Then taking account of the party's submissions in finding the relevant facts, which can, of course, turn on the credibility of witnesses who have given contradictory evidence um, about what they heard, saw or did, um, or on admitted opinion evidence. In some cases, taking into account evidence which was not called, and that's because of another common law principle, that evidence has to be weighed according to the proof which it was in the power of one side to have produced and in the power of the other to have contradicted. That requires consideration of an unexplained failure to give evidence or call a witness where that might reasonably have been expected. Next, taking account of other common law principles, such as the conventional perception that members of our society do not ordinarily engage in fraudulent or criminal conduct, and adopting a judicial approach that a court should not lightly make a finding that on the balance of probabilities, a party to civil litigation has been guilty of such conduct. Then in arriving at a conclusion on the facts found, judges, of course, must apply the law, including things like the common law onus of proof, which normally falls on the plaintiff or prosecutor, although on a particular issue, it may shift to a defendant or accused. And um, finally, of course, the common law standard of proof, 
which generally requires proof on the balance of probabilities in civil proceedings and proof beyond reasonable doubt in criminal prosecutions. Um, as I say it, it sounds exhausting. What about the second case then? Um, that was that's a judgment given in Singapore in the Singapore's High Court by Aidit Abdullah J. Um, in 2021, when Singapore's Prime Minister also successfully brought a defamation case about a false Malaysian article shared by uh, Mr. Hyan on Facebook. Um, that was found to have involved very damaging fake news with the result an award of Singaporean $133,000 damages. It's about a one-to-one -one exchange rate, um, but they're in a case of publication at most to about 400 people. Mr. Hyun was a self-described well-known campaigner for human rights and government critic. The article claimed that investigations were being conducted in Malaysia into secret deals between two corrupt prime ministers of Singapore and Malaysia in relation to building a high-speed rail. In issue were alleged imputations that Mr. Lung was complicit in criminal activity, activity with the Malaysian Prime Minister. His honour also had to determine whether the Prime Minister was just seeking to clear his name um, or whether he was trying to silence critics or en enact vengeance. And he had to consider the well-known cascade effect of posts on social media. His Honour, interestingly, there reviewed how internationally courts have had to grapple with the issues raised by publication and republication of false news on the internet. Um, he described what was then general knowledge about international efforts to recover misused Malaysian funds, including by the United States Department of Justice in relation to more than a billion dollars in misappropriated assets and charges which were being pursued in Malaysia in relation to criminal breach of trust, money laundering and abuse of power. He found that despite Mr. Hyun having learned of the falsity of the defamatory art article, he had refused to apologise or even publish a clarifying message, even though he removed the post after a very short period of time. The post suggested involvement in what His Honour said had then become a byword for corruption and improper government dealings, Mr. Lung proving, providing assistance of Singaporean banks in laundering stolen money and thus being involved in corrupt and criminal activities. In the result, his honour found some limited aggravation as well as some malice. That award of damages, I think, raises a very interesting contrast with that award of Ms Gaia in her difficult but very different circumstances. Well, what about regulatory reform? Um, I think there's no question that the challenges which plaintiffs and prosecutors pursuing the publication of fake news online can face in court given the onus which falls on them to prove their case by evidence. Judges still have to undertake, undertake fact-finding in the way that I've described, no matter the challenge that presents them for proving their case. This helps I ex explain, I think, the pressure inter internationally for regulation to prevent the maintenance of anonymity online. That lies within the hands of legislatures, as does the regulation of the takedown of fake news. Legislation is the way by which societies change the law over time, balancing all of the competing considerations which have to be taken into account. Society's views about what may be tolerated can certainly change over time, and it does. Anonymity is not now permitted in other spheres, for example, um, who owns and operates corp corporations, for, for instance. There is thus nothing which would prevent our parliaments regulating more closely the tech companies and their shareholders who profit from the platforms which they operate, which enable the publication and dissemination of fake news. That could help ease the burden which currently falls on those who seek to restrain wrongdoing involved in the publication and, dis and dissemination of fake news, um, which have, includes, of course, um, uh, those charged with enforcing laws in relation, for example, to domestic violence. That can be concerned with if pending, such as using carriage servers to menace, harass, or cause offence, an offence under the Criminal Code Act. Precluding anonymity and better regulating takedown regulation of fake news at risk of penalty for failure to do so could also potentially make fact finding in court cheaper and quicker as well as enhancing the protection of victims of wrongdoing involved in its publication. 
These are all matters for our parliaments to consider, uh, and they must undoubtedly balance other concerns, such as freedom of speech and rights to privacy, which society also values. Although I have to say it's difficult to see a public interest in the unregulated and anonymous publication and dissemination of damaging fake news by wrongdoers. Only on Tuesday in the Financial Review, it was reported that Facebook had engaged a Monash University criminolo criminologist, Professor Flynn, who has been studying the extent of technology facilitated abuse and has found that victims were falling between law enforcement cracks. And she's been appointed as one of its global women's safety advisors. It was also then reported that the think tank Reset Australia is calling for algorithmic audits to allow authorities to see and understand how, court, how content is being amplified and distributed. And last year, I know that the Chief Justices of both New South Wales and the Federal Court talked about um, the problems with algorithms um, uh, and how those who devise them uh, would be better served if they took some advice from lawyers um, uh, when they were talking about the problems which the robo-debt scandal um, uh, caused our society not so long ago. Well, before we have such regulation, what will judges do? Um, they will continue applying the mechanisms society developed for fact-finding in different times in order to deal with constantly emerging challenges in the cases over which they preside, including those increasingly presented by the easy, anonymous peddling of fake news, ever more difficult to, de to detect as it may be, to growing numbers of other people around the world some of which seriously harms others and in some cases inflicts real damage on society as a whole. Thank you all for the opportunity to share those thoughts. Yeah, that was really interesting. An amazing conspectus of precisely what a judge does in fact finding. That was like a bit of a masterclass, I've got to <laughs> say, from, from the perspective of the barrister. Um, one of the things that really struck me about that was this idea about the takedown orders, because I know in a conversation I would have with a client, if a judge says, these are the orders I make, you do as you're told, as quickly as you can. You do not exacerbate this. You don't want to be in contempt. Um, but when I first started studying law and thought about how you make amends in relation to, say, defamation, it was pretty straightforward and you, you said it you have to publish an apology and then you make a retraction. But you then talked about the, the grapevine effect and it mm. makes it almost impossible because it's gone. The, the horse has bolted. You've lost control over the very thing you're now trying to take down because it now exists in all these other forms because it went viral. And I think this is really, really hard, you know, trying to give effect to an order, the judge makes an order and then to give effect to it becomes very, very difficult. And I think this is exactly why, I mean, I imagine this is why you're saying the regulatory piece has to, has to play a part. I mean, is that the sort of thing you're thinking about? Absolutely. Um, and, and we have, do have other pieces of legislation, Occupational Health and Safety Act legislation, um, for example, which... Um, don't only require uh, remedies to be negative in a sense, but um, also positive to take positive steps to deal with the yeah. um, with the damage. And um, you see that in uh, land and environment legislation as well. So it's not beyond the reach of Parliament. Yeah, no. And one of my students in a subject that I teach this semester called um, Digital Economies and the Law. Um, one of my students on Tuesday when we were doing defamation in social media, topic number two, mm. he said that the interesting thing is if this was the workplace with this sort of conduct was occurring, the workplace would know exactly what to do, but it would fall within workplace bullying, workplace harassment mm. policies. It's just that in society, we just don't seem to have these policies that are strong enough. So we reach for defamation law as a way to stop people from doing this. But the nexus was articulated so well by this master's student in a way that I have to say I hadn't really brought together. 
until he said it. And of course, there was a conversation then in, in the class with that. Um, but anyway, yeah, thank you so much, Jessa Schmidt. That was um, right on the money um, and amazing timing because it is 6.30 on the nose and it's time to switch over to Dr. Mark Staples, who to continue on the theme of how do I know you? Um, I've only known Mark for a few years, but it has been an absolute privilege to work on the International Standards Blockchain Technical Committee with you, but also to chew the fat. We've managed to go to various places around the world doing standards work. Um, I'm in your, I'm in awe of what you're able to do with your publications. Um, just as a hint, Mark would never say this, but Mark's publications output actually skews Australia's standing in the Blockchain International Committee favorably. Um, and we're all very grateful to you, Mark, for leading the charge on the amazing um, publication that you've done in relation to blockchain, but also around your other areas of expertise. Um, so, Dr. Mark, over to you. And I believe what we're going to get a bit of a sense of is the scientist's perspective um, and a little bit of a, a deep dive into algorithms as well. But Mark, you're now screen sharing successfully. So right. over to you. Thanks very much. Um, fantastic. Uh, event to be a part of. Thanks very much. Um, and I'm, yeah, I'm speaking about truth and its limits. And Pips asked me to talk, uh, take a more kind of more technical uh, topic. And so I'm talking about that from the, my perspective as a computer scientist and software engineer. And before I start, I should acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands where I'm speaking from today. The Camaragal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to their elders. So. Um, Okay, so I'm talking um, about computers and software. And uh, computers are what um, Alan Turing here called universal machines uh, because they can uh, act as almost any other kind of specific machine. And I, I call them magic because what you do with a computer is you give it a program and then it runs the program and it, it has behavior. So you give it words and it creates function. And that's, that's why it's kind of magic in a sense. It's a bit like Harry Potter wizards they say some words and uh, make a spell and they change the world. And uh, you know that's what computers do as well. You give them words, which are a program, and then they behave um, in, in some way that you've told them to. So what I'm talking about today is what are the limits on truth about what a computer will do, uh, and perhaps in a sense what they should do as well. The idea of truth that's most important in computer science is um, from uh, Alfred Tarski who's a logician, and it's called a semantic theory of truth. And it's, it's about how language meets a world of interest. So truth here is when a sentence is satisfied by all situations in a world of interest. So here in this example, I've got two plus two equals four, and I put it in quotes so you can tell it's a sentence. And that's true if it, it corresponds to a world of mathematical objects where two plus two always equals four. So for Tarski, the language uh, was a logic. But um, more broadly, they can be programming languages, uh, models of various sorts. The world of interest for, for Tarski was pure mathematics, but the world of interest, for example, for a scientific theory will be the physical world. But the world of interest could also be other kinds of social worlds, such as the law. Um, I don't have time to get into all the limits on truth and proof in logic and mathematics, but there'd be lots to say if I had more time. So I'm thinking about verifying software. So in theoretical computer science, uh, as I said, programs uh, uh, represent algorithms and you give them to universal machines and the universal machine interprets the program and acts as a special purpose machine. So the languages here describe the programs and they describe a specification for what the program should do, the sort of relationship between the inputs and outputs. The world of interest is the behavior of these universal machines. And um, for Turing, these universal machines, they had an infinitely long tape. And so the behavior is just the symbols that it reads and writes to the tape. Uh, truth for programs is when the program executing on the computer, um, <clears throat> uh, when the specification for that is satisfied by all the possible behaviors of the computer. And computer scientists call that correctness. So the correctness of a program. So how do we go about uh, finding the truth how, or checking the correctness of a program. The problem is that um, computers, universal machines use kind of discrete binary logic. Um, the behavior can be wildly discontinuous. 
Um, for example, you know, when you write a program, you often have these if then else statements and like what the then branch does can be entirely different to what the else branch does. So there can be entirely different kinds of behavior. <clears throat> and that's um, very different to um, how physical systems um, normally behave, for example. Um, but it's not just individual, you know, bits. Um, but there's this sort of combinatorial complexity. Um, it um, and these programs can be possibly non-terminating. So because of its discontinuity, you can't rely on interpolation to establish the truth of what your program is going to do. You have to test every possibility. But because of the combinatorial complexity, there's too many things to test. So you can't test exhaustively. Um, for um, these programs, they're kind of in uh, these universal machines are objects of pure mathematics. And so we can use logical techniques um, to, to verify correctness. And so there are techniques like formal verification for giving very precise, um, uh, establishing correctness for very precise properties uh, and type checking and architectural approaches that can give, uh, you know, less, um, less precise uh, claims, support less precise claims. Um, so that's all about programs as kind of objects of pure mathematics. But um, part of the real problem in the real world is that real computers are in the real world. And I've got this, I like this quote from William Gibson, who um, was the author of, of Neuromancer, which was um, formative in the creation of the whole genre of cyberpunk. Um, and despite having um, described these new ideas about extreme virtual reality that um, uh, was a precursor to movies like The Matrix, he actually wrote the novel on a mechanical typewriter. And so when he finally uh, first saw a, a real computer, he was kind of disappointed because he'd been expecting this exotic crystalline thing. And what he got instead was uh, something that, you know, made noises like a scratchy old record player as the old um, uh, disk drive spun around. Um, so real computers, uh, real programs run on physical computers. Um, they're limited by uh, their physicality but they can also have more effects because they're doing things in the real world. So the language kind of as before uh, describes programs and the relationships that we want between inputs and outputs of the program, but also the physical resources um, uh, that are part of the computer itself. The world of interest is then um, behaviors in the real world, including the behaviors of the computer itself. Uh, so when, and what's important about real programs running on physical computers is um, when they have when they have, have bugs, um, when they're not correct, they can cause physical harm and physical loss. So here's a picture of the Ariane 5, uh, the explosion of the initial launch of the Ariane 5 rocket, and that failed because of a software bug. Uh, and it was because they used an old, um, uh, a component from uh, uh, Ariane 4, which used 16-bit words, and they were connecting it to a, a new system in Ariane 5 that had 64-bit words and, you know, fit the physical difference essentially in the size of the words um, and that the failure to integrate properly led to <clears throat> data being mismanaged and then eventually the loss of the rocket. Um, so problems with the correctness of programs are, are what, you know, is essentially what most bugs are. It's why we have most cybersecurity exploits, for example. And these things can emerge not just because we fail to reason properly about the logical parts of our program, <clears throat> but also as with the Ariane 5 rocket, um, that we can have sort of bad empirical theories for um, that we're using to reason about the correctness of our programs. So these bad empirical theories or incorrect assumptions can invalidate the correctness of, of real programs in the world and you know, directly lead to harm and, and loss. Um, but computers themselves are not the whole story. Um, we also have to think about how the computers are used in uh, systems. So computer-based systems are not just programs. They have um, computers, they have programs, they have software, uh, but they also have other things. They interface to the world for, um, for speaking with people, um, interfacing with people, they interface with Internet of Things devices, they communicate with other computers. And importantly, they're also used in an operating context. So for computer-based systems, it's not just about the input output behavior of the computer and its physical resources. It's also about fulfilling its requirements for use uh, in some sort of operating context. It's meant to help people do things. Um, so now the languages um, describe uh, systems and, and you know, how they're built and so on. 
but they're also now describing what users' requirements are for the use of the system. And the world of interest is now your real world application domain. Uh, and I'll get into that in a bit. So here I'm trying to position computer-based systems as just a normal, a normal kind of engineering uh, artifact. And the main kind of claims about um, in engineering that we want to establish the truth of are do systems meet their requirements? And, and so I've taken this opportunity to plug a couple of papers on the philosophy of engineering um, where I discuss how the sort of requirements for uh, systems in use breakdown are represented by requirement specifications, but we need to show that you know the designs we come up with correctly implement um, those specifications and that those designs are actually reflected in the real systems that we build. Um, I'm going to talk about three uh, kinds of examples of different uh, computer-based systems to kind of um, bring out some aspects of these, the, the sort of limits to truth related to these. The first kind of system I'm talking about um, is an approach called rules as code um, and, and systems that use rules as code in a similar approach. Rules as code is where we're creating and using models of the law. And these uh, models of the law are both human readable um, so that you can read them and check that they correspond with the law. But they're also um, machine interpretable because we want to use these models to help automate things in relation to the law. So we're creating a kind of a digital twin of, if you like, of legislation or regulation or policy. And there's been increasing interest uh, in this internationally and also in our region. So in this approach, the language includes an explicit model of, of the law, a body of law at a point in time, but also of legal situations, which correspond to say facts in, in a particular situation. The world of interest is, um, is in, you know, includes is essentially the law and, and the um, requirements that you're, you're trying to support with the uh, application that's using rules as code. Semantic truth here is assessed essentially by saying, you know, what would a judge say? Um, so, you know, regardless of whether or not the, um, the judge is involved in deciding the, the truth of specific facts about uh, a legal situation, they are um, just giving authoritative views about what the law says. Um, and uh, what I mean by this is that uh, this whole approach is not trying to replace judges or uh, kind of automate uh, judgment. What I mean by um, this thing about truth being assessed by what would a judge say is that's the criteria we're going to use to assess whether or not our model was good. So if our model of the law fails to correspond with what a judge would say, then that means our model is wrong, obviously. Our ability to create a, an accurate model of the law um, is limited by you know, our understanding of the law and social world. So here I would want to emphasize that it's, um, you know, in science traditionally where, where we create scientific theories, they're always tentative because we're never quite sure if they're going to be true of the real world, of the physical world. But um, when we're writing computer programs, it's not just the physical world we have to be concerned about. We have to be concerned about the social worlds. Uh, and, and the law is an example of that when we're writing computer-based systems that are helping us work in that world. Second class of system I'll talk about are blockchain-based systems. Um, I won't be able to describe in detail what blockchains are, but um, briefly, they are very, you know, often usually globally um, distributed and decentralized systems. Um, they support the creation of an immutable ledger of transaction records um, so that everyone around the world can have their own copy of this ledger, but they all know they're all looking at the same version of the ledger. Um, and blockchains emerged initially to support um, the Bitcoin cryptocurrency, uh, where the transaction records uh, on the blockchain ledger were the you know, Bitcoin transfer transactions. But they're now being used for many other purposes. For example, we can use them to record physical events in, in the supply chain. For example, a truck might arrive at a warehouse uh, in, the, in the real world, and we might record an event of that on, on the ledger. Um, but they can also represent other things, and increasingly they're used to represent tokens. Um, so I can have a token represented on a blockchain, and I might transfer it in a, in a transaction to, to PIP, for example. The tokens might represent an interest in property, perhaps. So if I hold the token, maybe the person issued the token said it represents interest in property or, or some other right of some sort. 
for the blockchain itself, its only world is this ledger, um, this global um, history that it, it has of all the transactions it's seen so far. And when smart, what are called smart contracts or little programs running the blockchain, they, they're just looking at the ledger itself. But we want to use blockchains as part of broader systems. Um, and so to do that, we create these Oracle components and they're called Oracles uh, in this domain. They create a bridge between this, the ledger and the external world. And so, for example, you might have an Oracle connected to an Internet of Things device so that, you know, when a truck arrives at a warehouse, um, a sensor automatically triggers the creation of the record that records that event on the blockchain. So for a blockchain-based system, <clears throat> the language um, includes, you know, requirements and so on, but also includes um, the, con the records on the ledger itself. Um, and the world of interest will include um, what those records are representing um, in your application. And so we, in our research, sometimes we talk about this as um, being, uh, giving rise to so-called, which we call parity problems or representational problems. Um, just because I've got a record on the blockchain of a truck arriving, does that mean the truck actually arrived or not? Um, maybe the sensor failed and the truck really did arrive, but we didn't record the event. Or maybe someone created a fraudulent event um, on the ledger, but the truck never did arrive. It's, but it's not just a physical uh, digital parity problem. There's this digital legal parity problem as well, which is just because um, I've issued a token that says I have an interest in property um, and I give it to someone else, um, you know, maybe a court is going to separately say that that property now belongs to someone else. Um, uh, but the, if the ledger is not updated, it now the ledger doesn't correspond to what the court said. So um, we can have you know a, a difference there as well. Um, last thing I'm going to mention and um, is is around machine learning. And when people talk about AI today, um, mostly they mean machine learning. Um, machine learning, kind of, I'm going to get this, this is very <laughs> brief, but um, roughly works like this. You're given some training, but training data is somehow meant to represent um, you know, things you're interested in. It, the training data itself contains lots of variables and has latent information in the data about what the relationships are between those variables. Um, then various what are called algorithms, machine learning algorithms, discover approximations to those relationships. Uh, and the approximations they discover are called models. And then those models are used to predict similar things um, about new data that wasn't in the training set. You're gonna use this model as part of a computer-based system to, that's, that's using AI. So now um, the language includes descriptions of the data uh, and the worlds of interest include what the relations represent in your application domain. Um, um, but there's a, there's a number of challenges for machine learning. Um, for a kind of an engineering approach um, because um, it, you know, it's not always the case, but often when you're using machine learning, you don't actually um, write down what your requirement specification are, is. So sometimes the, the, the requirements for your system is only latent in the data itself. Um, you, you know, you're in a sense given a blob of data and, and told learn that, whatever it is, that is, but you, you never, never necessarily, you might not commit to, to describing uh, your goal in a, in a sense in relation to what that data represents. Um, and, and tied to that, then the, the training data might not actually be representative of the real relation that you want to uh, form a predictive model for. Um, even if you do, um, it did have, you know, good training data, um, the algorithms might not discover the real relations. Um, and, but that can be hard to work out if, if, you're, if you've got a, an accurate uh, model or not, um, because it's very hard to get these models. They're just you know, big collections of very complicated matrices of numbers. They're not, not really describing how they operate. So they're notoriously, um, for most machine learning approaches, they're notoriously uh, black boxes and um, there's, there's a lot of challenges with having comprehensible or explainable uh, AI. Um, so I've kind of covered a lot of ground and um, really kind of instinct wanted to say is um, here in this, um, in computer science and software engineering, truth is mostly about how language meets a world of interest of some sort. Um, and the world of interest can be 
you know, mathematics uh, or the physical world, but also social worlds. Programs are very complex. Um, you know, perhaps the most complex things that humans have ever created um, or tried to engineer, maybe apart from genetic engineering. Um, but software engineering is still a very young discipline and the tools and methods and theories we're using to analyze programs are still, uh, you know, emerging. But nonetheless, we need an engineering approach for computer-based systems. And in particular, we need to think about the requirements for them. And those requirements are often gonna be uh, not just about, you know, mathematics or the physical world, but also about social, uh, social world, including the law. Um, there are limits on the truth to claims about computer-based systems limited by many things, They're limited by our reason, uh, our ability to reason about programs, um, by they're limited by our imperfect knowledge about our worlds of interest. And importantly, they're also limited by our imperfect knowledge about what we want our computers to do and, and our imperfect ability to agree on what we want computers to do uh, so that we can write down requirements uh, for these systems. Uh, right, thanks very much. Mark, that's amazing. Um, I, I, there's some great great questions coming into the feed and I just wanna give a shout out to Barbara, Gary and Christopher and Anonymous, which is sort of in light of what we're talking about, terrific that we've got somebody who I'm, I'm sure their first name is not actually Anonymous. I believe they are Anonymous, but thank you for your wealth of links and questions and suggestions and comments. Gary, I will be the next Truth Commissioner although somebody will probably create a deep fake pip. Um, so Mark, can I just ask you two philosophical questions before we, before we close? Yeah. The first one is this whole thing about language. You said there are limits on that, that last slide. You have, you, you know, where the limits lie. And I was just wondering how, how closely related is where we are and our capacity for an incredibly sophisticated language I'm so I'm thinking spoken and written language how much does that feed into computer programming engineering if we had a more sophisticated way of expressing ourselves would we have traveled further faster uh, or is it really dependent upon our capacity to articulate what it is we think this relationship should be between the program and then the physical world and our interests over yeah. there on that um so you know very often requirements are not written down as kind of mathematics um in a sense, they're um, in trying to create uh, uh, an understandable sort of requirement set. Very often, um, they're partly written down just using natural language, um, and there are always kind of um, uh, gaps that aren't really going to be covered by kind of mathematical theories. We we still want structured arguments about um, about these things, and sometimes you know that increasingly you know there is. That, you know, as as a, a discipline matures, the methodologies get more um, capable of expressing more uh, sophisticated requirements, specifications, and for reasoning about those. Um, there's a great um, a great book called uh, by Walter Vincenti about uh, called What Engineers Know and How They Know It that talks about um, engineering and knowledge, and he he's, he did a lot of aeronautics engineering. And uh, so it's got a good chapter in there about uh, flying qualities, which is how good a plane is to fly, which is kind of a, feels like a very subjective thing. But over time, the aeronautics uh, field has kind of developed various kind of ways of specifying what it is, you know, for a plane to be good to fly. Uh, and they develop various standards and metrics that sort of um, embody, embody the, the main elements that drive that good feeling. Yeah, that's interesting. It's a bit like the, the engineering of dithering. I often talk about this with locals because we've got a dirt road from our property. And the question is, should you go slower or should you go faster? Because if you go faster, you get the dithering effect, which is that idea that it sort of smooths out all of the corrugations in the dirt road. Yep. yep. Uh, I go fast. But that's for another day. That's, that's not my second question or comment. Okay, so uh, just, to, just to do some housekeeping before I ask my final question, we're going to need a link to that Vincenti... Um, what you know? What engineers know? Yep, um, sure. And then I'm going to get your 2014 and 15 philosophy yep. of engineering papers. I'll get the cases from the judge. We'll just make sure we get a really good collection of great content so that we can provide it to all of the attendees today with the follow-up email. 
Um, but the, the final thing was a lot of people asked the question, what's the future of AI? Where does that intersect with humans? There's a lot of work being done by people like Dr. Will Bateman and Dr. Damien Clifford within the HMI project here at ANU, which is this human machine intelligence project. Um, and one of the things that my students always love when I raise this is Moravec's paradox, the 1986 um, statement around, you know, computers are, re computers are really good at the stuff that humans find yep. difficult, but really bad at the stuff we find easy. And the example from Moravec was, or Moravec, if I'm pronouncing it incorrectly, was babies will recognise their mother's voice where an AI system would find that hard, but could prove Einstein's theory of relativity like that, um, whereas it would, for some of us, we'll never gra grapple with that. Where are we travelling? Like, where are we up to yeah. and where are we going with these converging, Mark? No, uh, no pressure, by the way. So I think to start with, yeah, people thought of AI as, as working out what humans were good at and, and trying to do that by computer. And so that's why they, they started with things like chess and so on. Um, some people have said, you know, wondering whether or not computers think is like asking um, whether or not the submarine swims, you know, it doesn't, it moves through the water in a very different way. Um, so I think these days people are not, um, are, are taking this sort of more integrated approach. They're talking less about artificial intelligence and more about collaborative intelligence. And so working out how computers, um, we can use sort of AI techniques, but use that to assist us with, you know, some of the things we um, are either not good at or don't want to do. Mm. Yeah, and I've just seen in the feed, somebody's just raised this question about postmodernism, which is hilarious because when we were having a discussion a, a couple of days ago to talk about how thematically we were going to draw all of this together between Justice Schmidt, Jonathan, Mark, me, we did land on postmodernism at the end as a bit of a, I mean, I think I, I said I blame postmodernism for where we are with truth. So can I park that, that and say, let's talk about that next Thursday in the masterclass. Of course, our guests are welcome to that, but you can rely on me being there. Um, I'll try not to plug what we do at ANU too much. I'll try and just, just, just stick to being as brainy as we all can and making that a truly enriching and engaging discussion. Um, as with all good events, it's three minutes to the hour, so let's wrap it up. Thank you so much, Justice Schmidt, Jonathan Harley and Mark Staples for representing the law, journalism and science this evening, doing it with bells on and with brains exploding. Thank you. Thank you to our more than 110 attendees. It's been wonderful to have you here and for your incredible feed into the Q&A, which will be brought to the masterclass next Thursday. I look forward to seeing everyone. That starts at five. It goes from five till six next Thursday. You'll get an email about it. Can't wait to see you. Um, Liz, thank you for your leadership with this and Gian in marketing for making sure it all happens so smoothly. Um, and to Cooper the dog for staying quiet during the important moments. Everybody have a lovely week, um, stay safe, stay well, get vaccinated, and hopefully see you next Thursday. Good night. If I, can I just acknowledge your contribution oh, in curating the conversation and really say it was just an extraordinary conversation that's Amazing. exactly the point at which we need to bring different perspectives to understand how, as a community and a society, we can address the challenges that the new world presents. So very grateful for the Menzies Foundation participants, but Pip... You do it with great style and substance. So thank you very much. No, thank you, Liz. Wonderful closing comments. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And good night, everyone. Thanks, Liz.